Great. Thank you very much, Bob, and good morning, everyone. I am going to cover prevention studies from COI in the following areas today. Population level effect of PrEP, the Pivoting Ring open label trial results, two studies on HIV transmission clusters. There was a lot at CROI on this topic this year, and I just chose two of the most interesting, and outcomes of rapid linkage to care and ART. So let's start with a study from New South Wales, Australia, on the population level effect of high PrEP coverage. New South Wales is an area approaching the UNAIDS 90-90-90 targets, and they have a highly concentrated epidemic with 80% of new infections in MSM. And the question of this study was, what is the population level effect of rapid targeted PrEP rollout? In New South Wales, the eligibility criteria for PrEP on MSM are shown here, along with the estimated HIV transmission rates or acquisition rates. Those include rectal CT and gonorrhea, infectious syphilis, condomless anal intercourse with a regular virally unsuppressed positive partner, condomless anal intercourse with casual partners who are positive for unknown status and methamphetamine use. The investigators estimated that 3,700 MSM in New South Wales would be eligible for this study, and they examined a cohort or efficacy outcome of HIV incidents just on the men who started PrEP during the rollout and a population level or effectiveness outcome, which was comparing HIV incidents 12 months prior to PrEP rollout and 12 months after the rollout for the 3,700 finished. So what did they find? First, they massively underestimated the number of MSM who would be eligible and interested. They reached their target of 3,700 in eight months, lifted that cap, and enrolled about 8,000 men in the time they had initially anticipated. They had 30% drop-off of PrEP during that period, which is important since this was a real-world effectiveness study, and that level of drop-off looks comparable to what we see here in the U.S. But they didn't lose those men to follow up entirely. They had an HIV test on 97% of them. In the cohort, there were just two new infections in around 3,900 person years, and both of those were in men who were not taking PrEP. One never started, one stopped several months before he had an acute HIV infection event. And that translated to an incidence rate of just 0.05 per 100 person years. In the population level effect analysis, the 12 months prior is shown in blue, and the 12 months after they finished enrolling those 3,700 is shown in red. There was a 32% reduction in recent infections, defined by surveillance as being in the past year, and a 25% reduction in all HIV diagnoses. So this could have reflected a secular trend. This came up in the Q&A session, but the investigators argued that nothing else really changed so dramatically during that time as PrEP did, and they attributed most of this to PrEP rollout. So that was very encouraging. So now let's come back to the US, where uh, CDC also released some updated estimates of PrEP eligibility and uptake. They updated these estimates from the 2015 estimates, and importantly in these, accounted for heterogeneity in HIV risk and MSM population by state. To do this, they used an analysis presented by an Emory group about two years ago that estimated the number of MSM in each state and large urban area using the American Community Survey. They applied estimates from Purcell's paper to that of what proportion of those MSM had been sexually active in the past year, and then applied CDC estimates that about a quarter of those sexually active MSM were eligible for PrEP. So their updated estimates shown here by key risk groups and overall, compared to 2015 estimates on the second line, did, did not look that different in the total, 1.2 compared to 1.1 million but looked substantially different in the makeup of that population. So MSM in the revised estimates account for a much larger proportion of people who are eligible for PrEP in the US and heterosexuals a much smaller proportion. So then they looked at PrEP eligibility and uptake by race and this map shows the states, the proportion of adults rather, with PrEP indications who are black by state and as would be expected with HIV epidemiology and the demographics of the US, that group was mainly concentrated in the southeastern United States and the Midwest. They then estimated minimum PrEP uptake by race using a database that acquires data, collates data from commercial and mail order pharmacies. So very importantly, this was a minimum estimate. It is missing a lot of sources of PrEP, including 
integrated health systems like Kaiser and the VA. But what they showed was that in every region, and especially in those with the highest uh, proportion of black persons who were eligible for PrEP, there was a substantial racial disparity and racial difference in PrEP uptake as shown here. So that's a big problem, and I don't think we know the solution to that yet or the solutions. Next, I want to briefly review a paper from, that Susan Buskin led on PrEP resistant virus here in King County. And I'm presenting this in part because there was recently an item in the news about PrEP failure, uh, which you can look at at this link if you haven't yet seen it. That was the second PrEP failure, probable PrEP failure, I should say, in King County, which occurred uh, just around the time of Croy. And there was a first one in 2016, again, a probable PrEP failure. And Public Health Seattle King County does investigate cases that appear to have a PrEP-resistant virus, so those with a K65R and M184V who are also viremic and could potentially transmit. The goals of these investigations are first and foremost to engage those persons in care and achieve viral suppression, but also to notify them that they could potentially transmit to partners who are taking PrEP. This is a very small number of people. Among new diagnoses, 2008 to 2017, just three of 1,800 cases had primary TDF-FTC resistance. And looking at the entire population of people living with HIV in King County, there were just 12 people who had measured, excuse me, measured TDF-FTC resistance by genotype, as well as substantial viremia, and an estimated additional nine guessing among those people for whom we did not get genotypes. So really want to emphasize this is a small population, 0.2%. And the outcomes of those investigations are shown here. First, most of the people by the time the investigation was going on were no longer viremic. Others had died, relocated, or were in hospice and were not at risk of transmitting. Another group was we were working to get them into care or they were already enrolled in the MAX clinic. And then a small number, just five people, the patient or provider, uh, declined public health assistance. OK, let's move now to a different form of PrEP, the Depivering Ring studies. Two years ago, two phase three trial results were presented at CROI, one by Jared Baton and team, which showed about a 30% reduction in HIV incidence with the use of a monthly Depivering vaginal ring. That was the ASPIRE trial and the ring study. Both of those trials offered open label enrollment to all of the women who'd been enrolled in the phase three trial who were still HIV negative at the end of the trial and who were not pregnant, and then followed those women for HIV incidence over time. So the first of these was HOPE, which was the open label extension of ASPIRE. First, 92% of the women offered the depivirine, uh, decided to take it, which was very high. Adherence in this group, as measured by residual drug in the ring, was very high and higher than that in the trial, 89% versus 77%. And HIV incidence was 1.9 per 100 person years, compared to the placebo arm of Aspire, which was 4.5 per 100 person years. DREAM, which was the open label extension of the ring study, had very similar results with high uptake, 900 women in this study, very high adherence, especially compared to the phase three clinical trial, and HIV incidence rates that looked quite similar, 1.8 per 100 person years compared to 4.1 per 100 person years. Now, these were not contemporaneous controls, and there could be, in a counterfactual scenario with secular differences, uh, lower incidence rates in the control population if it had been done simultaneously with the open label trial. So both studies did very sophisticated statistics that I won't even attempt to describe to estimate what that would have been in the counterfactual scenario. And both came out with very similar numbers, 4.1 and 3.9 per 100 person years. So the incidence of 1.8 or 1.9 per 100 person years was substantially lower. And essentially, I think the lesson of this was that when women knew the safety profile and the efficacy of the depivering ring, they were even more willing to use it and more adherent to it. So this was very promising. OK, going to switch now to transmission clusters and give just a minute of background for anyone who may not be familiar with this. HIV nucleotide sequence data is obtained by public health from the HIV clinical genotypes that are sent. So those are routine clinical genotypes. And the sequences are obtained for public health purposes. Transmission networks are those 
networks of cases or viruses that are genetically related. And CDC funds health departments to use the phylogenetic data to focus prevention efforts. Exactly how that is done remains somewhat unclear, but we won't get into that in great detail. So at the time of this study, there were 27 participating jurisdictions, but soon all jurisdictions will be participating in this. And CDC conducted this study with the objective of detecting rapidly growing clusters to initiate prompt focused public health action. So they defined priority HIV clusters as those that were both recent, meaning had happened within the past three years, and rapid, meaning that at least five individuals in that network had been diagnosed in the past year. Among the participating jurisdictions, about 52,000 people were, di were diagnosed with HIV during that time, and there were 60 clusters that met that priority definition, with between 5 and 42 people in each cluster. Those came from all regions of the country and 20 states. The transmission rate in the clusters was estimated to be 42 per 100 person years, with a range of 21 to 32, which compares to 4%, uh, excuse me, 4 per 100 person years overall, so substantially higher transmission in those clusters. They then looked at the makeup of cases in the clusters versus cases that did not cluster, and as would be expected, a substantially higher proportion of clustered cases were MSM and were young, but also a much larger proportion were Latino, and a smaller proportion were black. Importantly, though, I think that largely reflects the jurisdictions that were participating in this. As she said in the Q&A session, a few jurisdictions were driving the race ethnicity differences. And although she didn't say it, I think that essentially what we're seeing here is Texas. So that doesn't necessarily reflect the entire United States. OK. So another HIV transmission cluster study, this was from Los Angeles, looking at phylogenetic patterns of transmission among transgender women. So this one was really interesting because it is very hard to identify trans women and trans individuals in HIV surveillance data because of the way that cases are classified. So trans women in the US certainly have a high HIV prevalence and incidence, estimated prevalence of around 25%. And per surveillance definition, trans women in HIV surveillance are typically identified as either MSM or heterosexual females. Los Angeles, however, puts a lot of effort into reclassifying their trans cases into transgender women who also inject drugs or transgender women who likely acquired HIV through sex. And they have an estimated 7,000 transgender women in King County. When they looked at their trans cases, now shown here on the right in a graphic, in Los Angeles, first of all, actually overall, not just the trans cases, 36% of sequences clustered with 1,700 total clusters. And in those, there were 167 transgender women. So then they looked more closely at the trans women compared to cases with other risk factors. And first, compared to other risk factor cases, the transgender women did cluster at the highest frequency of any case. So that was interesting. And then they looked at assortativity. So assortativity gets to the fact of who people are having sex with. And it's compared to random. If there was random mixing in the population versus a measure of the extent to which cases assort with each other. And what was interesting was that transgender women linked more than expected to other transgender women. So this probably doesn't mean they're having sex with each other, but rather that they're in the same sexual networks and cluster pretty uh, tightly. And more than expected to cis males, but less than expected to MSM. So the conclusion of this group was the genetic patterns of transgender, excuse me, gen genetic partners of transgender women are attractive targets for public health services because they may be able to identify additional trans women among their sexual contacts. OK, last study was outcomes of the rapid initiation of ART in San Francisco. In 2015, San Francisco launched this citywide after a successful pilot, which was really a goal to get everybody newly diagnosed with HIV on antiretrovirals as quickly as possible. So the rapid protocol is that all new confirmed cases should be linked to care within at a maximum five working days, ideally within one working day, typically the same day. And at that first care visit, that antiretroviral should be started unless there is a risk for fatal iris. So they worked a lot with providers around the city to try and get this to happen. And showed their outcomes here. 
Time to many things shortened, but the bottom line in this table is also the most important thing, which was that they cut the time to viral suppression in half from 130 days to 61 days. So that was interesting. We still don't know sustained viral suppression or other outcomes, but did see some encouraging outcomes there. Okay, thank you very much. Next up is Dr. Collier. Yes, sorry. Shoot. Thank you. Great to be here. Sorry. Work or you, you should probably maybe put it right here. Okay, is that better? So great to be here. And we are going to dive into antiretroviral therapy. Here are my disclosures, mostly um, grant support from NIH, and then I am a DSMB of a Merck sponsored study. So we're going to talk uh, initially about FDA-approved agents and regimens, and then about a few issues of investigational art. Um, as Julie mentioned, there's way too much to cover, so these are highly selected. The first thing I'm, we're going to talk about is Bictegravir, and this is just a background slide for those of you who have not heard of this. This is a potent integrase strand transfer inhibitor. It's active against first-generation uh, integrase inhibitor um, resistant isolates. It has no, it does not need boosting and it has no food requirements. It has a very long half-life so it can be um, dosed once a day and it was FDA approved as a fixed dose combination called Victeri with 50 milligrams of Victegravir, um, TAF, and FTC. There were several studies of this fixed dose combination at the conference and I'm just going to highlight two of them. Um, one was a switch study that uh, showed 48-week data of this combination. People switching from the fixed-dose combination of Triamec with Valutegravir 3TC and Abacavir to this new Victegravir-containing formulation had over 500 patients. These patients had been virally suppressed on the, their original um, formulation, and the bottom line of this, no matter how you looked at it was that the switch resulted in comparable outcomes. This is virologic, and then there was adverse events, renal biomarkers, and they did not see any resistance in the very small proportion of people who failed virologically. Um, I'm highlighting this study, even though it's only a 24-week study, because it's a very large study in women. Almost 500 women who had were, had virologic suppression either on a boosted PI or an integrase inhibitor containing regimen um, were switched to this new uh, fixed dose formulation and um, it looked uh, very similar in terms of virology, adverse events, numbers of people who quit, biomarkers. So I think this is encouraging data and it's uh, fairly unique to have this much data on women um, on a relatively recent um, approval. The next FDA-approved compound is one you may not have heard about. It's ibilizumab. It actually was approved during the week of Troy, and it is a um, compound that is has been developed to treat people with HIV who have highly resistant um, virus to other compounds and it's <coughs> approved for use in combination with other antiretrovirals. It's a humanized monoclonal antibody. It's an attachment inhibitor. Um, and the data that was presented in CROI was about the resistance pattern of this compound in their phase three study, which involved um, 40 patients. 38 of those had resistance testing using a monogram phenosense assay. And what the um, report showed was that resistance to other drug classes didn't affect um, ismibilab susceptibility. Now, um, tenofovir uh, elefantamide, or TAF, there were a number of um, presentations. This is my quick take, and this very complicated slide um, was an attempt to summarize multiple data. But the bottom line 
um, there, there are basically two bottom lines, one of which is that in 28 adolescents, if you add TAF to their current antiretroviral formulation, the drug looks safe and effective and has PK similar to adults. And then in a variety of different randomized studies of different um, strategies, either in antiretroviral naive or experienced patients switching from thing, various um, backbones with TAF, um, all of these, um, the switch looks safe, effective from a virologic point of view, um, and those switching to TAF have favorable effects on bone mineral density, renal biomarkers, but in the one study that was a 48-week study, there were significantly worse effects on um, total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides, presumably because of the removal of the positive antihyperlipidemic effect of TDF. There were um, multiple um, presentations supporting the association between the use of abacavir and cardiovascular risk. And it was really the sum total of the data that I thought was worth highlighting. There were two human studies, one mouse model study, one in vitro study, all of them done by different people with different methods, and they all supported this association. So it's really much more data than has been presented before. Just to give a glimmer of the human data, the Swiss cohort did a study where they, uh, called, they um, did coronary, heart, um, coronary CT angiograms in over 400 people, and then they did a very sophisticated analysis, which I'm also not going to uh, describe, um, to address the confounding factors in their population. And abacavir was the only one of the 10 commonly used antiretrovirals to be significantly associated with high-risk um, plaque and coronary artery disease. Um, in, a, in a completely different study, which was a platelet function sub-study of a prospective randomized study, which was switching people from <coughs> abacavir uh, 3TC to TAF-FTC with a stable third drug um, these investigators described that switching was associated with lower platelet reactivity after the switch to TAF. So now we're going to jump into a few issues with respect to investigational antiretrovirals. And the first that I wanted to mention is a drug called MK8591, um, which currently doesn't have a name, um, but is a novel um, nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. And I tried to find a picture of translocation, and I couldn't find one on the internet that I could understand. But bottom line, this is a reverse transcriptase inhibitor that, in, that interferes with reverse transcription at two different, of two different mechanisms. And um, this drug is in fairly early phase development, but uh, appears to have a half-life in HIV-infected patients of 50 hours and the triphosphate, which is the active moiety of 120 hours. There has been a phase one study using doses of half a milligram to 30 milligrams a day showing antiretroviral activity. Um, the other um, thing that is uh, useful to know is it's, it appears to be active against NRTI-resistant variants, and phase two studies are underway. The study that was um, described at CROI was a mostly a, pharmaco, a pharmacokinetic study. It was a double-blind um, placebo-controlled study in HIV-negative individuals with doses of a quarter of a milligram, three quarters of a milligram, and five milligrams, which were given daily for four to six weeks. Um, they had an optional vaginal and rectal biopsy substudy that wasn't very useful because not very many people enrolled. Um, of the 36 treatment courses, there were four drug adverse events. All were mild and moderate, and the um, striking information was the PK. The, there was a steady state intracellular um, triphosphate levels were more than tenfold above the IC intracellular triphosphate IC50 levels, and in all individuals treated, including those in the lowest dose group, the levels were detectable for 30 days after dosing. So this appears to be a compound that is well tolerated with very long half-life and levels that are shown to be effective at suppressing HIV. And I suspect we'll hear more about it both for treatment and possibly for prevention. 
And the last thing um, we are going to talk about is um, the idea of using two drug regimens for treatment of HIV. And this seems to have caught the um, attention of a number of investigators. There have been several studies, some with negative, some with um, favorable results to date. The data that were presented at CROI were very similar to the kinds of previous data that were presented. This was a randomized open label 48-week um, study of 145 <coughs> persons who were antiretroviral to naive, uh, were antiretroviral to um, naive. They were treated either with the dual regimen of a ritonavir boosted dolutegravir plus 3TC or the same two drugs plus TDF. And bottom line um, in terms of efficacy is that the um, results appeared to be similar. There were numerically fewer related adverse events to the drugs with the dual regimen. There was higher total cholesterol with the dual regimen presumably also because of the lack of tenofovir. And there, uh, just to highlight, there's a growing body of studies like this, relatively small, um, dis describing sex successful dual regimens. The successful ones have all been either boosted PI plus lamivudine or second generation integrase inhibitors plus NNRTI. And uh, many of you may also be aware that there is the FDA approved the first um, fixed dose combination of a dual regimen recently. Currently, in both European and US uh, treatment guidelines, these are viewed as alternative regimens to be used only in special circumstances. And there was a really terrific talk about antiretroviral therapy that uh, reminded everybody that there are really lots of questions about these regimens. Um, that need to be addressed before they really should be considered mainstream. Um, and I think the bottom line for uh, the CROI antiretroviral um, implications for clinical are that antiretroviral drug development is continuing. Um, recommended art is continuing to evolve. And um, so stay tuned in the future and please support research. And thank you very much. Adrian, you get this. I can give you my I don't want your paper. You don't want it. I'll be happy to give it to you. Thank you. All right. So I have the delight to be able to summarize. Um, some cherry-picked talks on a variety of topics, but focusing on comorbidities and clinical outcomes um, in people with HIV. And the priority topics that I chose to focus on were TB, uh, aging in the HIV population, alcohol substance use disorders, and hepatitis C. So I'll be presenting abstracts for all of these. So first topic near and dear to my heart, tuberculosis, TB, HIV. TB remains the leading cause of mortality in people with HIV worldwide. Um, but one way to prevent that is using TB preventive therapy. Unfortunately, globally, uptake has been very poor. And one big barrier to getting people with HIV on TB preventive therapy is that duration of treatment is very long. Nine months of isonizid, up to 36 months in some places is recommended. Um, and there are shorter regimens for TB preventive therapy that have been approved, but very little data in people with HIV on antiretroviral therapy. So based on a mouse model, from about 10 years ago that showed that a shorter regimen of an intensive treatment regimen might be as effective as the current nine month single drug regimen. Uh, this group, the ACTG, conducted a multi-center, open label, phase three randomized control trial uh, comparing two different TB preventive therapy treatments um, in people with HIV, many of whom are on ART uh, in, not, I said nine, it's 10 countries. So the non-inferiority design and the comparison arms were the standard of care, which is nine months of isoni daily isoniazid, which is what we use here primarily as a first-line regimen. And then the intervention arm was one month of daily isoniazid and rifapentine. And rifapentine was uh, weight-based dosing um, 
So one month versus nine months of therapy. They had a long follow-up to follow for incident TB outcomes and death. Um, so three years after the last enrollment, so at least three years of follow-up for all people. And the primary outcome was a combined endpoint of active TB that occurred, TB-associated death or death from any unknown cause. And there were also secondary endpoints of safety, tolerability, all-cause mortality, and drug resistance, as well as pharmacokinetics. Because of the importance that is increasingly being realized of TB therapy with antiretroviral therapy, potential for interactions. So um, the investigators enrolled 3,000 HIV-infected adults and adolescents in 10 countries. Those are listed here. Um, Africa, Asia, uh, South America, and the US were all represented. Um, both high-burden settings and non-high-burden settings were represented. Anybody with HIV from a high-burden setting could be enrolled. But for people with low incidence, low TB incidence settings, they enrolled uh, participants who were either skin test positive for TB or um, quantifuron positive um, for TB. So on average, these were 35-year-olds. Median TB4 count was relatively high, reflecting that more people are getting on ART uh, at higher CD4, so about 470. Um, you can see the majority, the vast majority, about almost 90% of participants had CD4s greater than 250. Uh, about half of participants were on ART at entry, and only efavirenz or nevirapine anchored regimens were allowed for this trial because of uh, drug interactions, potential for drug interactions with other HIV ART regimens and the rivapentine in particular. So outcomes, there were 33 outcomes in the isonized nine-month regimen, 32 outcomes in the one-month isonized rifapentine, and overall incidence of outcomes was basically identical between the two groups and well below the non-inferiority margin. So no difference in incidence. Um, and then looking at breakdown by sex, CD4 count, uh, and baseline ART status, also no difference seen in the two study arms. Here's just another way of showing that uh, no difference over time in the, the duration of follow-up time. They did break down to CD4 strata of less than 250 um, and greater than 250. And there's a little bit of a trend showing um, more outcomes um, in the one-month preventive treatment arm. But again, this was not statistically significant. You'll remember that there were relatively few participants overall who had less than 250. Um, in the secondary outcomes, just briefly, I'll summarize that there were a uh, rare number of cases that um, in the active TB that did develop, rare single drug resistance, but it wasn't different between arms. Uh, few grade three adverse events overall. Most were grade three, very few four or fives. Um, and the um, nine months of isoniazid had more liver or neurotoxicity, whereas the one month isoniazid rifapentine had more hematologic toxicity overall. Both were quite safe. So conclusion, one month of isoniazid rifapentine is non-inferior in preventing TB in people uh, with HIV, as well as preventing TB, TB death, uh, or death from unknown cause in HIV-infected ad adults and adolescents. Um, and this is potentially quite significant, taking a, a nine-plus regimen down to one month. The caveat being that uh, concerns still remain about drug interactions with uh, the rifapentine and many of the current antiretroviral regimens, uh, certainly the first line regimens used in this country, and increasingly dolutegravir in particular, um, looking at uh, being more commonly used in the developing world. So remains to be seen what can happen with that, but very promising for reducing the burden of TB and death in people with HIV. So switching gears now to uh, domestic, largely a domestic uh, question of uh, aging in HIV. And this is a study um, looking at the VAX cohort, uh, which is from the VA. And um, the investigators published some, or first showed some data looking at the age of diagnosis over time. And it's a, a busy graph here, but highlighting that if you start in the early years, in the late 1990s, uh, it's black and then getting brighter to green is more contemporary. This is looking at the median age at diagnosis of HIV uh, in this VA cohort was early 40s in the late 1990s. And then the age peak sort of gradually, you can see it's starting to shift up over time 
And then in the, starting in 2010 up to 2015, the curve shifts to a bimodal peak, so a peak in the 30s, and then increasingly a peak in the late 50s and moving towards 60s. So there's this increasing peak of people being diagnosed with HIV at a later age, and they also noted there are delays in diagnosis, of people being diagnosed at later ages with more severe, more advanced HIV, lower CD4 counts, more AIDS-defining illnesses uh, when they're diagnosed at older ages. Um, and so the group asked the question, is there a way we can target screening, try to identify people, older people, um, for identification to prevent these long delays and move that curve a little bit? So they did a pretty interesting study looking at common non-AIDS illnesses in their older populations um, and kept keeping in mind the background that currently the CDC recommendations for um, HIV screening are between 13 and 65, um, but do we need to extend that bound upward and who, who do we screen with that generalized screening? Um, they suggested that if you have any population where the prevalence of HIV is going to be greater than 1%, everyone in that group should probably be screened. So keeping that in mind, they looked at a number of non-AIDS conditions, um, and I'll uh, highlight bacterial pneumonia and zoster. So looking just at the age groups, so this is both HIV-infected red bars and HIV-uninfected age-matched controls in the VA cohort. You can see that bacterial pneumonia is relatively common as a diagnosis among people who are 40 and up. Um, in people who, have H who are HIV negative, still is a 2% prevalence um, in this group, but much more common in people with HIV, so up to 13%. So if you look at the relative risk of this non-AIDS condition in people with HIV versus not, they calculated the relative risk for each of, um, in each age band, and then they were able to calculate a pretest probability of somebody having HIV if they were diagnosed with this non-AIDS condition. So for example, 1% of less than 40-year-olds had bacterial pneumonia. 6.6% of people with HIV had bacterial pneumonia in this database. Relative risk is 5.3%. So without knowing anything else, somebody less than 40% has a 0.3% probability of having HIV. But if you know that they have bacterial pneumonia, use this relative risk, that bumps up their risk for having HIV to 1.58. And so you can see by doing this risk adjustment, um, with all of the age bands, the pretest probability of HIV was between 1.5 and almost 4, 4% for all of the people with bacterial pneumonia. So this raises the question, should we be screening everyone with bacterial pneumonia for HIV um, in all age groups because their pretest probability of having HIV is already well over 1%. They did the same kind of calculations with herpes zoster, and here the pretest probability of HIV in all age bands range from two in the highest age bracket where herpes zoster is relatively common, HIV positive or negative, but particularly in the other age bands, less than 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, uh, pretest probability of HIV was between almost 7 and 11. They looked at a few other conditions, thrombocytopenia, lymphocytopenia, and anemia. Um, and the conclusion here was that in all of the age bands, less than 60, you ended up with a pretest probability greater than 1% uh, for lymphocytopenia and anemia. In 60 plus, there was not enough of a difference to move that pretest probability up. So overall, the group concluded that we're seeing a high number of new diagnoses in the aging population. Um, people with older age with HIV are more likely to have certain non-AIDS uh, defining conditions, but these provide an opportunity to increase testing um, by being a signal that there's more likely to be HIV among this group. So they recommend HIV testing for anybody at all ages presenting with bacterial pneumonia, zoster, thrombocytopenia, and then in less than 60 uh, people with lymphocytopenia and anemia. Okay, switching gears again. We're going around the globe and the population here, back to the 90-90-90 goals, and focusing on the third 90, getting people virologically suppressed. So 
um, considering the group of people who are incarcerated with HIV in the US in particular, it's a group with a lot of risk factors for poor HIV outcomes. Um, people often have comorbid mental illness, comorbid substance abuse issues. Um, and we can see uh, this group showed that uh, in a study they did, people with HIV who were incarcerated had pre-release rates of virologic suppression of almost 60%. People are incarcerated, ready access to medications. Um, but post-release rates of virologic suppression dropped substantially to only 18%. And so what are the reasons for this? At post-release, people very quickly relapse uh, to substance use if they had an existing substance use disorder. That makes adherence difficult. People have other life challenges uh, that makes adherence difficult. But if there's this much virologic drop-off, there's no way that this third 90 of virologic suppression is going to be achieved in the, in the population of people who are incarcerated. And that will have a network effect throughout um, their networks once they're released, if they are uh, viremic and potentially transmitting as well. So this group asked, can we provide an intervention to address the issue of alcohol and drug relapse to try to help prevent people from relapsing on release from incarceration and make it easier for them to take meds consistently with the goal of, it, of improving virologic suppression. So they conducted two parallel randomized control trials, one looking at people with HIV with substance use disorder and one looking at people with HIV uh, with opiate use disorder, recruited participants while they were still incarcerated pre-release and randomized um, two to one to the intervention arm, which was uh, a series of long-acting naltrexone injections to try to reduce cravings and prevent relapse um, versus a placebo injection arm. So one injection pre-release and then five monthly post-release. What did they find? This is the group with opiate use disorders. Um, pre-release, the prevalence of virologic suppression was 37 in the treatment group, 55% in the placebo arm. So again, this, they look different, but they're not, these, they were randomized successfully, they're small numbers. Um, but these are not statistically significant differences at baseline of virologic suppression. Um, in the placebo arm, it went from 56 virologically suppressed to six months later, 40.7% were virologically suppressed. That is not, that was not statistically different. Um, however, in the treatment arm, people receiving the extended release naltrexone, um, the prevalence of virologic suppression increased to 60.6% post-release, which was a significant difference. Similar results were seen in the group of um, participants who, had, who were identified as having alcohol use disorders. Um, the placebo arm, no significantly significant difference in percent viral suppression post-release, whereas um, per, a percentage 31 to 56% increase in virologic suppression post-release in the group receiving naltrexone. So the, the limitations is that six months follow-up is a reasonably short-term follow-up. Remains to be seen whether this can be persistent, but promising as an intervention, particularly for people with a lot of overlapping um, comorbidities and challenges to virologic suppression. All right, and then very briefly, I'm going to um, highlight this study that looked at um, the hepatitis HIV co-epidemic in Europe, in Switzerland. Um, and in Switzerland, as in many other um, European settings, they're noting that their HIV hep C um, epidemic is rising in men who have sex with men quite acutely, um, while it is coming down in <coughs> injection drug users, which is maybe not what we're as used to seeing. But um, this group um, has a large cohort of uh, this is almost the entire population of um, Swiss persons with HIV. And they conducted a three-part study of baseline screening for hep C um, among all MSM with HIV in their cohort. Um, and then for people who are positive, offering treatment for hep C and a behavioral intervention. And then doing a post-treatment repeat screen um, for both incident and prevalent infections. So in the, in the first screen, they found 4.8% uh, prevalence of hep C, including 30 incident infections, which were defined as an RNA positive without um, an antibody positive yet detected. Everyone was treated with uh, either standard of care DAAs for hep C 
or an investigational combination um, that was available to this population at that time, very high rates of sustained virologic response. Uh, and then the result, in the, they see the last sweep of a screen. There were 16 incident infections and then 12 chronic infections remained. And most notably, this is a 49% decrease in incident infections, suggesting that by treating everyone in the population, they had reduced transmission and we were seeing fewer incident infections. Um, there was also a 92.5% decrease in chronic infections, which you would expect since you have treated everyone uh, with a known infection, more or less everyone. So this was promising as a, an adaptation of the HIV treatment strategy for treatment as prevention um, to the hepatitis C uh, epidemic as well. But a cautionary note, another abstract presented looking at France, which had a similar hep C epidemic in the MSM population with HIV, showed also high rates of hep C treatment uptake, but still an overall increasing incidence overall uh, with a fair amount of reinfection, suggesting more targeted need for um, pretty aggressive identification and treatment of people with hep C. I'm going to give a lightning round. This is going to go fast, I promise. Um, cryptococcal meningitis, not a huge problem in the US, still a very leading um, cause of mortality in sub-Saharan Africa, people with HIV. Results of the ASTRO study were presented that showed that adjunctive sertraline um, to standard cryptococcal treatment had no effect. That was disappointing. We still need better treatments for cryptococcal meningitis. More good news for TB and TB HIV. The inspiring study showed that using um, TB treatment along with dolutegravir based antiretroviral therapy with twice daily dosing of dolutegravir uh, was equivalent, tolerable, safe, and antiretroviral um, efficacy equivalent to efavirenz based therapy. So, questions about dolutegravir interactions seem to have been overcome by BID dosing, and that should be fine to use with TB treatment going forward. Unfortunately, Bictegravir, the new NC that Ann just talked about, um, even if dosed twice daily, still interacts with rifampin in TB treatment enough that it becomes, it falls below the therapeutic level. So the manufacturer is not recommending Bictegravir be used with, TB, with rifampin containing TB treatment. And then finally, some more potentially disappointing news for TB preventive therapy. The IMPACT study compared um, treating latent TB in pregnant women with HIV using the current recommended WHO guideline for immediate during pregnancy versus waiting until postpartum after pregnancy. Um, found similar safety for moms uh, between immediate and delayed, but did see a slightly higher risk of adverse fetal and pregnancy outcomes in the immediate during pregnancy treatment um, compared to the postpartum TB preventive therapy. So keep an eye out for guidelines that may change around when women with latent TB and HIV should be treated um, after pregnancy. All right, to Bob. All right, thank you, Adrian. All right, hang in there. Uh, last one. So um, I'm Bob Harrington, and I am going to cover uh, the reservoir HIV vaccines and cure. So uh, sadly, I have I have no disclosures. <laughs> That's not my slide, but I guess we'll keep going. Um, so first, um, uh, this group um, out of Silicano's lab, uh, the data was presented by Khan was looking to find out uh, what really constitutes the HIV reservoir. So just to remind everybody what is the reservoir, if we start with a CD4 cell that's infected with HIV, that proceeds to this robust uh, uh, infection with replication competent HIV. And 99% of those CD4 positive lymphocytes are killed during that primary infection. There's a very small fraction that are not killed. Those cells become latent. Those are the memory CD4 T cells, and they contain replication competent provirus HIV, which is the, uh, shown right here. But the question is, what are these cells? Are they all uniform cells? Are they all different? What really constitutes that true 
HIV reservoir. So this group started to uh, answer that question by taking PBMCs from HIV-infected patients who are on therapy and who are suppressed. They took those, uh, those cells, some of which had uh, HIV in them. They stimulated them with PHA and got them to express HIV envelope um, molecules on their surface. And then they labeled them with, uh, with uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies directed against those, uh, those envelope proteins and then linked them to a, a, a magnetic bead and separated them. So they could separate these cells into those that were not infected and that those that harbored a replication competent HIV provirus that was able to express envelope uh, proteins on its surface. And then they went to enrich those by doing fact sorting. So this is just a sample of two patients here, 610 and uh, 207. These are the controls showing that the cells uh, that were not so selected did not express very much envelope. But down here, the cells that were selected out had high degrees of envelope expression. So then they took those cells and they looked to see, did they actually make uh, GAG, which is a structural protein of HIV, did they make GAG RNA in those cells? And you can see that the envelope expressing fraction made much more GAG RNA than the control cells. And similarly, those that had lots of envelope expression here also had higher rates of uh, infectious units that came out of the virus. So it looks like they're enriching uh, the cells for ones that truly have uh, HIV in, uh, in them. Then they set them up in a limiting dilution experiment, which they wanted to get single cells per well uh, that had HIV in them. And they only had three patients here that they were doing this for. And then they took those wells and looked to see, of those wells of individual cells that had grown up, how many of them actually were, uh, had HIV in them. And the blue, the green, and the red are three different patients. And each line represents a single cell. And you can see that for many of the uh, cells, they had full length HIV that was expressed in, uh, in those particular wells. So there were a bunch of them for this patient, there were two of them for the patient in green, and there were a few of them for the patient in red. If they're all exactly the same color, then they were all exactly the same provirus. So for uh, the blue patient, all of them were the same. For the green, the two were the same. And for the red patient, one of the isolates was a little bit different than the others. So then they thought, well, OK, it looks like all these cells are the same, but how can we, how can we prove that? And they, th they sought to prove it by looking at the T cell receptor. The T cell receptor on different CD4 cells should be unique. It shouldn't be the same. So to prove that, they looked here first. Uh, they looked at the T cell re repertoire in healthy donors. So these are three different donors. They looked at 101, 99, and 90 different clones in all those three healthy donors. And if the, the circle is clear, it means that there were no identical uh, T cell receptors in that pool. So all different T cell receptors in these three individuals. ART treated patients, there was one that had a few TCRs that were similar, but for the most part, they were all relatively unique. So then they went back to the patients that they studied, and they looked in the control cells in those patients, the cells that were not HIV infected, and looked at the T cell receptors in them. So they looked at 81 clones here, 13 here, and 19 here, and almost all of them were quite heterogeneous. This person had a few clones that were similar, but for the most part, they were all heterogeneous. When they looked in those, uh, those cells that had HIV in them, again, and remember, almost all of them had identical proviruses in them, then they all had exactly the same, it was unique to each patient, but they all had exactly the same T cell receptor, suggesting that they're exactly the same cells. They had the same HIV provirus, they had the same T cell receptor, and that tells you something about the reservoir, that the true reservoir in HIV-infected patients really contains clones of expanded cells that contain replication competent virus. And it might be the proliferation of these clonal populations over time that is actually a way that the reservoir is maintained or in some people is expanded. So these individual clones, those, these T cell, yeah. memory T cells that exist in patients that is the reservoir, maybe isn't thousands or millions of different cells. Maybe it's a few cells that are just proliferating um, and making up the reservoir in individuals. 
Okay, vaccine. Uh, so um, this was presented by, by Green, who I think is a disciple of Lewis Picker, and I thought I'd include this slide, which is just some background from a publication uh, by Lewis Picker, who's down in Oregon in Nature uh, seven years ago. He published this data using uh, rhesus CMV, so cytomegalovirus, uh, that contains a, uh, SIV gag uh, genes and used that CMV gag to immunize rhesus macaques that had been infected with SIV. So this is the plasma viral load of rhesus macaques that were infected with CMV and then boosted with CMV. And there's 12 animals here, and half of them, when they were vaccinated with this CMV gag uh, vaccine, ended up with a plasma viral load that was very low or undetectable in most of them. Compare that to nine animals who were vaccinated with a DNA vaccine and an AD5 vaccine expressing H HIV proteins, and none of them were able to control HIV after vaccination. They did an additional analysis and they looked at HIV DNA and, uh, and RNA and tissue. So this is DNA and this is RNA. These are negative controls, so very low levels of DNA and RNA. These are CMV gag va uh, vaccinated uh, monkeys. And you can see again gag, these are I think eight different monkeys. Very low levels of nucleic acid in the tissue of all of these animals. And compare that to conventional controllers where you get logs higher uh, levels of gag DNA or progressing animals that have even higher levels. So vaccination with this rhesus CMV HIV expressing protein vaccine led to very low levels of DNA in their tissues. Okay, so that's the background. So uh, this group wanted to understand, well, how is, this, how is this working? What are the actual immune responses that these monkeys have that is eliciting such excellent control of HIV? So it's kind of a confusing slide, but these are six different rhesus macaques, and this is just the gag uh, amino acid sequence here. Whenever you see a little block, it means that in that monkey, uh, for those amino acids, they, uh, they found an immune response that was directed against those amino acids, that part of the protein. So you can see here the, the ones in blue and the ones in green are the ones we'll focus on. One interesting thing is they found that none of these immune responses were MHC1 restricted responses, meaning the classic CD8 T cell response against the protein. They didn't find any of that in these monkeys. They found the blue or the, or the violet boxes represent MHC class 2 restricted responses, which is a little unusual. And then the green are MHC E restricted responses. So this was a surprise that part of the adaptive immune response that is not typically associated with control of viral infections, those were all the responses that they found in these monkeys. And some of these uh, protein segments here were common to all of the monkeys, and they called those the supertope region. Okay? So, so what the heck is MHC class E? This was, a, this was a big surprise. So MHC class E usually doesn't do this. It usually inhibits cell killing during, during normal non-pathogen antigen processing. So here's an intracellular uh, piece of protein that is digested by the proteasome. It is then uh, bound to MHC class E, which then migrates up to the cell surface, and it prevents natural killer cells from killing that cell. That's the usual function of MHC class E. There have been, uh, there are some pathogens, TB, uh, uh, Salmonella, CMV, EBV, and HCV, that do get, their antigens do get processed by MHC class E and can elicit a CD8 T cell response. And this is an area of intense uh, investigation right now. But for the most part, MHC is known as, as, a, as an HL, as a, uh, HLA allele that prevents the cell from being attacked and killed. So that was interesting. And they thought, well, we found this in, in uh, rhesus macaques. So why don't we look and see if what we can find in a different kind of monkey? And so they looked in, I can't say this word, 
sino monkeys. Let's call them sino monkeys. And they compared sino CMV with rhesus CMV and found that the rhesus CMV had deletions that uh, the sino CMV did not. It had deletions of 120 of these genes called unique long 128 and 130, and it had a deletion of unique long 146. These genes are involved in cellular tropism, and the 146 is involved in expressing a viral cytokine. So the rhesus vaccine had deletions of all of these, and it had MHC class 2 and E and supertypes, supertopes. The sino vaccine had deletions of only this, and it behaved differently, eliciting uh, epitopes that were restricted by MHC class 1A and class 2. And only by deleting the 146 uh, gene from the sino CMV did it start to behave like the rhesus macaque did. And they had these MHC class E restricted responses. So they dissected the differences between the rhesus and the sino uh, CMV and found what was responsible. So that's cutting to the chase that now this vaccine, a human vaccine, using human CMV as the vector with the same deletions, unique long 128 to 130 and 146, is going to enter clinical trials next year. So this is human CMV that has HIV gag genes spliced into it, and we'll see how that works to uh, uh, protect uh, humans from getting HIV. So this is a really exciting animal vaccine that now is going to be moving into human trials next year. Okay, last one over, over, sorry, HIV cure. So this, uh, this last um, uh, abstract got a lot of press. Um, it was looking at uh, a BNAB or a broadly neutralizing antibody called PGT-121 plus a latency reversing agent, or uh, this is made by Gilead, 6290 and assessing whether or not this combination of drugs would do anything to uh, deplete the reservoir in infected monkeys. So we're looking at PGT-121 plus TLR7 or toll-like receptor 7 agonist uh, on ART-suppressed art -suppressed, uh, uh, SHIV-infected monkeys. So this is a big monkey study. 44 monkeys were infected with this strain of SHIV. And all were started on antiretroviral therapy very early, so a week after they were infected. And after two years of suppression, they were given this a broadly neutralizing antibody and this latency reversing agent. And then at week 130, uh, ART was discontinued. So this is the setup. Here's the monkey. They all get infected uh, with SHIV at, uh, at time zero. A week later, they get put on antiretroviral therapy. They're all suppressed all the way up to um, 130 weeks. A quarter of them get nothing. A quarter of them get the latency reversing agent only. A quarter of them get the BNAB only. And a quarter get both. So the results. The levels of the antibody in the blood, lymph node, and tissues were undetectable starting eight weeks after they stopped antiretroviral therapy. There were no significant CTL responses, and they were not in, and those responses were not increased in the group that got both the latency reversing agent or the BNAB. Proviral DNA, a marker of the reservoir, was significantly decreased in the dually treated animals. And following interruption, treated monkeys exhibited no viral re rebound or delayed viral rebound and lower set points than the other groups. And no, um, uh, and I'll show you that data in a second. So this is data showing just that this is when they got treated with the antibody. So this is the antibody treated group. This is the antibody treated group plus the latency reversing agent. And by the time they interrupted antiretroviral therapy, there was no antibody around in either group. So the antibody had been there late, but then it disappeared completely at the time that they stopped antiretroviral therapy. <clears throat> this is looking at HIV DNA in PBMCs and in lymph node, and this is the dually treated animals, no DNA in their PBMCs, and when you looked in their lymph nodes, no HIV DNA in their lymph nodes compared to those who got the antibody alone or got placebo or just the latency reversing agent alone. 
And this is time to viral rebound. So this is the group that got neither, and they rebounded a mean of 20 days after they stopped antiretroviral therapy. Those that got just the latency reversing agent rebounded at the same time. Those that got the antibody rebounded much later, and those that got both rebounded a mean of three months later, or four months later. And significantly, some of those monkeys got no rebound at all. Five of them in, the, in this group, two of them in this group, and one in this group. So then they did the real experiment where they took lymph node and blood from those monkeys that did not rebound, and they challenged new monkeys that had never seen SIV before. And none of the new monkeys got infected. Two of them who had had cells from uh, previous monkeys who had rebounded got infected. But of those monkeys who were infused with lymph node PBMC, with lymph node uh, cells and, and blood cells from the monkeys that had not uh, rebounded, none of those naive monkeys uh, seemed to have got SIV. So it looked like the monkeys who were treated with TLR7 and the, and the antibody had had their reservoir depleted. So dual in treatment with this BNAB and this latency reversing agent suppressed <clears throat> uh, uh, in suppressed uh, macaques who were started on ART a week post-infection led to decreased HIV DNA levels in blood and lymph node, delayed or no rebound, and they may have deleted the reservoir as judged by these negative adoptive uh, transfer experiments. So uh, this got a lot of press and people are wondering now whether or not these broadly neutralizing antibodies can be used to deplete the reservoir in HIV-infected people who are suppressed on antiretroviral therapy. So. All right, so we'll stop there and we're way over. So if you have questions, you'll have to come up and ask us personally. And thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.